Thank you, Lord. Well, I would like to ask you for a moment to think about the, the reality of your life and who you are and how important that is for who you are. And the gift that God has given you is very important. First of all, there's no one responsible for you but you. You're responsible for yourself. And we live in a world that has, well, kind of delegated responsibility away from each one of us, <clears throat> and we're kind of taught through social psychology that we're all just victims of society, which is not true. We're victims of a fallen Adamic nature. And I'm responsible to recover myself under the enlightenment of God. Amen. <laughs> look, son, look at me. You, look at me. I'm the man, baby. I didn't come in here on a skateboard. There's churches that'll teach you and set up a skateboard for you, but I'm trying to set up eternity for you. I love you. I love that boy right there. I want you to keep looking at me. Thus saith the Lord God, I have a call on your life. I am the God of eternity and the God of glory. I have elected and predestined things for you, but Satan also has a call on your life. <clears throat> he wants to destruct and destroy everything you touch. He wants to break the heart of the girl that he created for you. He wants to pollute your children when you become a man so you can't have them. He hates the kingdom of God and he hates you. But today you're in the house of God. <clears throat> God has some things to say to you today, as he does to all of us. Sometimes the ones that has the most potential is the ones that Satan will tw attack the quickest and the, the strongest. <clears throat> We're in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> chapter 8. I started off talking to you about your life, how important your life is. darkness will step on your life, try to put out your hope, put out your light. <clears throat> I love you, Joe Bastic. I, one of the things I love about you, Joe, is you know you have great need for God. I love that about you, Joe. And that makes everything simple for you. A lot of you try to think everything to death. But Joe, he's just, it's all been broke down for Joe. He lost his first wife. He lost his first family, his children. Courts tore his life apart. Part of that could have been his fault, but not all of it. He married Angela. They have another family. Angela, you love the Lord, but you don't have the need that Joe had. You have other things you're assigned to, you think. But Joe's hope and his sanity and his reality is based in nothing else than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Without, jo without Jesus, Joe knows he's a dope and he's a fool. Now, I could ask the most sophisticated people in this church to stand up, and I would say the same thing to you without Jesus Christ. Sir, you're a dope, and you're a fool. <clears throat> Son, can you hear what I'm saying to these people? I'm straight, aren't I? Huh? Yeah, I didn't come in here riding a broom or a skateboard. There's not a lot of difference. I came here representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And son, you're not going to be a, a young child all your life. You're going to grow up and be a man, so you might as well learn 
when you see adults, oh, that's what I'm going to be, instead of saying, oh, my God, an adult. The truth is the only thing that will set you free, and knowing about the truth will not set you free, and knowing <clears throat> the doctrines of the truth will not set you free until the truth has pressed you into brokenness and put you deep into God, and you can't be sent forth by more than you've been broken and put in. And that's what makes you precious to me, Joe. Because when you hear the song of Zion, there's a shout in you. Not a question, why am I here? Why am I where I am? Why is this happening to me? Why, why? That's idolatry. Well, why am I? Well, why do I feel this way? Because you are full of yourself. Because you have not abandoned yourself to the high calling of the person of Jesus Christ and who he has elected and predestined you to be. And I see old Joe out there with his trailer that God gave him, pulling it around an old car that's been wore out three times with his great moor that God gave him, singing as if he had a new truck. And Joe just trying to live. He's just trying to be a whole man. He's just trying to provide for Angel. He's just trying to provide for his children. But you question him sometime, Angela. You question him. Instead of submitting to him, you question him. Stop it. Stop questioning his dignity and stop questioning his insight. And while he may not be as smart as you think he might be, I say to you, he's smarter than you ever thought about being. For he has wisdom upon his head. And he has wisdom upon his shoulders. Because he's totally dependent and relying upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what separates the man of God, the woman of God from everyone else. I don't care how much you got in the bank. and I don't, that's, that's just nothing. Give me poverty if that is in my, if wealth is in my way, but give me glory, give me wisdom, give me insight, give me hope. Not the filthy lucre of this world. It has a place. I'm not against that. Look, that, that has a purpose. We're in this world, and that's how this world functions. But we are more than this world. And that was Jesus' conflict when he came to Israel and they received him not. They received him not because they did not know who he was. They were incapable of knowing who he was. Because they had sold their soul to the company stole, if you'll let me put it like that. In the Baptist church, they had become Baptist. In the Methodist church, they had become Methodist. In the Christian church, they had become Christian. In the Presbyterian church, they had become Presbyterians. The only thing wrong with all of these names is that we're just one generation away from atheism or revival. That's what's wrong with that. And God will use man to build something, and then man will corrupt it. And so Israel, the great nation of God, in that nation there was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they were in charge of the law. They were rulers of the law. We have to have law and order. Let me tell you something about the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was designed to legislate morality. And when I was a boy, you could get fined for cussing on Main Street because the law legislated morality on Main Street because there were women there and there were children there and you don't talk like that and it was against the law and you could be fined. The reason you slow down at a school zone is because they are legislating safety and morality for those children 
And you know, we just get to where we got a little faster through it and a little faster through it until the law takes us down and takes some of that filthy lucre away from us. The, jo- the law's job is to legislate morality. But you cannot legislate spirituality. You cannot legislate righteousness. Righteousness is of the heart. I love him because he has found me. I love him because I was blind and I didn't know I was blind and now I can see what he was trying to get me to see. I love him because I now am awakened to the light and I'm no longer in the darkness. That's what Romans talks about. That's what the whole gospel talks about. Thank you, son, for being with me. You're with me now. I thank you for that. I love you. Obedience is of the law. A heathen can be obedient. Don't spit, don't cuss, don't drink, don't commit adultery, don't commit fornication, don't lie, don't steal, don't murder. A heathen can do all of that. But submission is of the spirit. And when Connie Barnes gets up and she's been in the Word and she's been with prayer and she walks in the Spirit and she walks by faith, it's not what Royce can do for her, it's what she can do for her husband. And so she has the ability to discern his need before he ever knows he has the need. And so he, she is intervening in his life and meeting his need before he ever knows he has a need. And she's ahead of the curve. That's called, wives, submit yourselves to your husband as unto the Lord. You don't submit to him because he's worthy. You submit to him because Christ is worthy. And he has founded the institution of marriage, and he has commanded you to submit to him. Submission can only happen in the Spirit. Say with me, please. Obedience is of the law, but submission is of the Spirit. This is Jesus' problem when he comes to Israel. Israel was a nation of laws. Israel was a nation of the law. The law of God was given to them. They were to keep it. Did I tell you the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes? Well, they were the enforcers of the law. And something has gone terrible awry with Judaism. It is still God's nation. They are still God's people, but not all of them are chosen. Something terrible has gone awry. Because Father God is a God of a family, and his family has now ceased to be a family, and in the temple it's a business, and the keepers of the law, they no longer love the people. They don't love the people. The law says, thou shalt not commit fornication, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. All these things were written for the moral character of Israel. God wants morality. Homosexuality is an abomination. Any man that sleeps with his neighbor's wife, he shall be put to death. This is what the law says. You say, that's a little severe. It's a little severe for the husband whose wife you stole and slept with. It's a little severe for the children of that family, what you did in your lust drive, in your out-of-control insanity. It has nothing to do with them being right with God. It has everything to do with a moral standard, a moral lifestyle of character being set up. And so there has to be order. But you can have order and then you can, the people that are called and instituted to institute the order, what happens if they stop loving the people that they're instituting the order over? Hello. And that's what's happened here. He came unto his own. And they could not recognize him. They could not take down who he was because they did not love the people. 
And what happens to you as a member of this church if you cease to love the people in this church? Well, I, you, you, I just know what they are. Well, yeah, they're just what you are. That's who they are. They're just like you. If you ever have the truth, and the truth is put in you, and the old you is crucified, and the truth has illuminated and lit you, and the truth has now procreated with you and extended you beyond you, you now are that truth which you heard. You now are that truth which was brought to you. And so when you see Jesus in a manger, that was you in your new birth when you see jesus walking down the trail of life overcome deception overcoming temptation that is you in the new nature and that he has accomplished for you and it's yours in the spirit if the truth can ever break you and extend you into the example of who he was i'm trying to tear something down here i'm trying to Stop you from getting to be pitiful you and call yourself a Christian. I'm trying to stop you from being compromising you and calling yourself a Christian. I'm telling you, when Jesus overcome compromise and when you see him in this book walking down the road to Emmaus, that is you. I don't even know where you can hear me. I don't even know where that means anything to you. Because if it doesn't, You'll never amount to a hill of beans. You'll be just like the uncles and the aunts before you. You'll be just like your, your, your law, uh, lawless, unregenerate family. You will not change. There's no purpose for you living on. And this is what Jesus meant in his glorified mission as the Son of God, the Prince of Glory, as he walked into Israel, the very nation of God, the keepers of the law. He found out they, don't, they hated the law. They kept it for the prophet. They kept it because it put them in a higher position. I'm the cop. I can pull you over. I can do about anything I want to do with you. I'm the president. I can tell IRS to do with you what I want them to do. I am in authority, and I'm going to take this thing over. No, no, you're not in authority. You are a fool. God is in authority. Yeah, that's right. The sooner I can learn that, the sooner I can prosper. The sooner I learn that, the sooner I can become what God has predestined me to do. True. No. John chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Now, if you was here Wednesday night, you'll know what all took place before 8-1. He went to the Mount of Olives. He's been telling them all through chapter 7 who he is. He says in chapter 7, verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine of who Jesus is, what he came to do, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He, he tells them he is the Christ who's come down from heaven. He is the Word. We learned in 6 that he's the bread of life. He's the living water. And they, they hate him. And we learned Wednesday night they kept trying to kill him. They hate him. They, they're murderers. Here they are, the leaders of God's nation, and they're murderers. They are filthy. They are dirty. They are vile. They have perverted the purpose of God for his Israel. They're as bad as Hitler. They do not love the people that they're 
forcing the law over? Wouldn't it be something if the highway patrol that's out there forcing the law and, and trying to create a moral society for us, wouldn't it be something if he loved us? Instead of just having a job and my duty, wouldn't it be something if your, do your doctor loved you and he's just not practicing medicine? Wouldn't it be something if husbands and wives and children obeyed their parents and love? Wouldn't it be something if all of a sudden the light of God could hit this nation? Amen. We wouldn't need locks on our doors. But it's every man for himself, is it? Get all you can, can all you get, and set on the can. It's me and mine. This might be a good place to stop and tell you I'm not mad at you. I love you. <clears throat> but I'm not some little hireling. I didn't come in on a skateboard. Well, here they are, John chapter 7. Jesus stood in verse 37 of the last day, that great day of the feast. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Thus spoke of the spirit that had not yet come but would come. So there he is prophesying to them that what a Christian is going to be like. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they sent out these officers to arrest him. Look at verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? This is what the Pharisees and the chief priests said to the officers. Why have you not brought him? <clears throat> the officers answered, <laughs> We were helpless. Never have we ever heard a man speak like this. Now, when we get over in the 8th chapter, we're going to find out that Jesus now manifests himself and declares himself to be the light of the world. Oh. Say with me, please, light. light. Say enlightenment. Say illumination. Look at John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying... Read it with me, please. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am what? <clears throat> he that followeth me shall not what? But what shall they have? <clears throat> oh, let me, be, let me really break that down for you. Their life shall be lit. They shall have illumination. When they read the scriptures, when God wants to emphasize a special thing to you, he can illuminate that and make it a rhema, take it off the paper, put it in your heart, and extend it in what he's been talking to you about for three days. Israel has lost this. So there he is. Their plot to murder him has failed. Look at verse 46. The officer said, Never spake a man like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Look at them. They're in charge, and they don't like anyone. They're in charge, and they're full of themselves, and they only want to get all they can, and can all they get, and sit on the can, and they want to control you, and use you, and bind you. They have become demonized. They have become the enemy of God in the seat of God. How could a great nation like this ever fall so low? I'll tell you how it could fall low because our founding fathers, <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin and George Wars and others told the nation, warned the nation, do not copy what Europe does. Europe is a godly whoring society and they are they will pollute your new wonderful country they'll they will destroy the law of god in your constitution 
don't hire any teachers from Europe. But today we send our kids to Europe. Why would you want to go to Europe? I've been to Europe. Everything there is third rate. Mm. Verse 15, chapter 6, 7, excuse me, chapter 7, Nicodemus said unto them, He that cometh to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look out, look for out of Galilee arose no prophet, and every man went unto his own house. Now that's very important right there. Or right, we went through all this trouble and all this war and all this fighting and all this hate and all this stuff and they're at trying to murder their own Messiah because they're so blinded. That's how blinded they are. That's how blinded they are. That's how perverted they are. And so they all just quit in exhaustion and all went home into their own house. Tommy... And Bonnie went to theirs, and me and Connie went to ours, and Enoch and Janice went to theirs. And Jesus, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but he had no house. He had nothing on this earth. He had no house to go to. Look with me, please. Luke chapter 9, verse 58. And Jesus said unto them, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have no nest, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, follow me. And the man said, suffer me first. It's always that. It's me first. Well, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to preach the gospel. I want to live the Christian life. But me first. Let me first get through my teenage fun, 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 fun. Year. Let me first get past my sowing my wild. After I sow my wild. Don't you know that you'll lose half of your soul, if not all of it, while you're doing No, no, no. Lord, I, I want to follow you. Say it with me. But what? Me it's always you first, isn't it? It's always you first, the idolater. You see, my goal is to press this and, and preach this with such anointing and such power that <clears throat> I'm not accusing any of you. I'm just preaching it with such power and, 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 and enlightenment that God is the one that's activating the responsibility and giving you the answers. Let the Word of God judge us all this morning. He had nowhere to lay his head. He owned no house down here. I love 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, if you would turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It's the most beautiful verse. It's one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. Amen. Would you read that with me, please? For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was what? And yet for our sakes he became what? That through his poverty we might become what? Oh, my goodness. Here's what it says. For Christ, who was rich and had everything, became poor and had nothing in order that you and I who were poor and never had anything could become rich and have everything. Back to John chapter 8 verse 2. And early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and he taught them. Now, this is the way the Jewish temple worked. People would come to the temple and pray. I've been to India. I was over there for, uh, <clears throat> for a month. <clears throat> and we'd get up before daylight and we'd have hot tea and we would pray. And that, that's, 
that's how they operate. They prayed that way. They'd go to the temple and they'd go to the temple and pray. And so Jesus got up early that morning going to the temple, knowing they would be there, and they knowing this is his usual thing to do, he gets up early. How's early? Well, it's probably about daybreak. And he comes to the temple. Remember, where did he spend last night? At the Mount of Olives. Had no house. Had no place to lay his head. Enoch and Janice didn't invite him. Bonnie and Tommy didn't invite him. I didn't. Me and Connie didn't. We, we, did, we didn't think of it. We're, we're so troubled. We don't know what's going to happen to our nation. Our money might not, not be worth We're so upset about what could happen to us. Me first. Me first. Me first. God, don't you love me? God, are you not going to give me what I... God, me first. Jesus said, hey, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to get over a house. You're going to have to get over a car. You're going to have to get over being wealthy. What way? Doesn't God want us to be wealthy? Yes, but you had to seek Him first, not the wealth. Seek Him first, not the girlfriend. Seek Him first, not the preaching ministry. Look how blessed I am as a pastor. Look how favored I am. Look how rich I am. I have you. I have this church. Look how beautiful a sanctuary. Look, look, I've preached in nothing most of my life and never dreamed I would have a Joe Bastic. A passionate man for the Lord. I never dreamed I'd have. You know, I would, yeah, I'll tell you what. Let me tell you what I see wrong with Joe Bastic. The thing that I see wrong with him, I need a hundred like him. And the next thing is I can't reproduce one. Because God made him, and God keeps him, and God's the only one that can give me another one. And I love you, Joe. And he's your family, Angel. He is. He is. He's the father of your children. He is. He is. He is. And his little old trailer with his little old lawnmower and his little old weed eater, his little old junky, wore out car, he drives it around and acting like he has a three quarter ton diesel pickup with computers in it and, and lie. He's just as happy. He is. He's one of the richest men in the church. Who? Joe Bastic. Well, there they are, early in the morning. They're all in the temple. We got them in the temple? Verse 3, where are they? They're in the temple. And, he, and the scribes and the Pharisees, here they come. Here, who, are the, who are the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, this is the first time in the New Testament that the scribes are mentioned with the Pharisees. And here they come. Now, these are the people of yesterday who were furious with the officers because they did not bring him in so they could kill him. So here they come. Now Jesus is in the temple. He has this group, and he's starting to teach them, and they're all sitting around. They're having a nice little Sunday school session, whatever you want to call it, and they hear this commotion out of the, uh, the door. And everybody kind of stops, and they look out, trying to see what's happening. Something is taking place. In the verse 3, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And they came in and they drug her and they did not love her and they did not care about her. And they threw her on the floor, the dirt floor, in front of Jesus and in front of all the meeting. There she is, slam. What clothes she had on, she's trying to clad herself, cover herself. And here's what they said to him. Remember who they are? Who's the Pharisees? Say they're the law keepers. Who are the Sadducees? Who, who are the, they're the law keepers. <clears throat> now let me tell you the truth about them. They don't love the law. 
they don't love, they don't care anything about the law. They use it. You'd be surprised how many in church really don't care anything about Jesus. They just use the church. You'd be surprised how many preachers like myself, they really don't love the saints. They just use the saints. Another collection. Uh, uh, numbers and growing this and increasing that and changing this so we can grow, 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 grow. We turn the Bible into a marketing tool and we become user-friendly so that the filthy can come in here and remain filthy and feel comfortable. Thank you. There he is. They said unto him, Master... This woman was taken in adultery. Say it with me, in the very act. Look what they say. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Let me bring one clear point to you. They, they, they wouldn't want to stone the woman. They wanted to stone Jesus. She wasn't the issue here. Jesus is the issue here. Their whole concept of yesterday failing, they now come back and they say, well, he preaches that he's come for the lost sheep. He preaches that he's come to give sight to the blind. He preaches this. Let's trip him with the law. Whoa. Moses said, the law says in the commandment that such should be stoned. <laughs> what sayest thou? There you see the hideous face of Satan. Go all the way back to Genesis and when Jesus cursed the man and the woman and then he curses Satan and he says, Satan, your seed and shall bruise the heel of the woman's seed, and the woman's seed shall step upon your head and crush it. There we see the picture of this demonic, hellish devil as he's working through the shadows and the soulish realm of these people as he keeps coming in and out, a dark satanic procreation of evil and wickedness and vile. He now possesses the court of God. In another case, Jesus said, Don't, do not do what these people say, but honor the seed of Moses. <clears throat> what should we do with her? Moses said we should stone her, but what sayest thou? Well, let's take a look at Moses' law just for a moment. Let's see what Moses says about this. Leviticus Chapter 20, verse 10, Leviticus 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Well, they were right in the fact of God's law. Did I tell you that, that God's law was to, pr to produce morality? And God said, this is how serious I am about Bill not running off with Mary that belongs to John and John not running off with Martha that belongs to Bill. This is how serious I'm about it. If that kind of nonsense start, then they're to be executed. Now, you can say all you want to that the death penalty won't deter crime but the fellow just got killed won't do it again, will he? And this is a God institution. And he'd be surprised. Son, don't go to sleep while I'm talking. Hey, 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 don't, don't, don't you lay your head back. I, I'm, I'm important. I'm somebody. Now, you might do your English teacher that way, but I'm not teaching English. I'm teaching eternal life here. I love you. You know I love you. Have I convinced you I love you? Uh, yeah, you better you better nod your head yes. All right, come on, put it right there. All right, you stay awake and you listen to me. You say, well, he may never come back. Well, he ain't here now. 
And where have you been, Mr. Underwood? And I noticed on the calendar I'm supposed to marry y'all. What makes you think I'd marry you? You're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents. And you want me to marry you to her? And you want to marry him? And he don't even know where he belongs? And you don't even know where you belong? Now, uh, let me tell you all everybody here how much I love these kids. Do you know I love you, sir? Stand up, big boy. Do you know I love you? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, give me a little love. Amen. I'm a real deal. Yeah. All right, I know you are too, man. But you ain't been here. You can't get this in any other church in town. Now, y'all don't want me. All you got to do is tell me we won't have a church fight because I'll get my little Connie and we'll get in her little Buick Enclave. It's paid for. And we'll sell what we need to sell. And we'll go on down the road and we'll find some little podunk church that don't know up from down. And I'll find me a dozen Joe's baskets who don't have a pot or a window and who will shout Jesus. And I'll give the rest of my life to them. But I'm not interested in recreating the prostitute of the church. Amen. You remember when I came here, Kelly? You remember where your wife was, where your sisters were? Do you remember where they were? And we made holy war. Do you remember that? Stay with me. Don't quit me. Oh, Brandy. Oh, Brandy's a sweet girl, and she's got her children. Yes, y'all are good, and y'all are fine, but your children will turn on you if you don't hold up the standard and the banner of God. And if they don't turn on you, they'll just, you'll just produce nice little whirlians. Are y'all keeping the camera on me back there in the little video room? Good. We're having trouble in the video room. There's no one finer than young Cox back there. And he comes down here and spends hours in that thing. But he has a little attitude adjustment that we're going to fix. Brother Cox, you listening? Because, Brother Cox, I can fix your adju attitude adjustment. And I don't care what your mama thinks and your daddy thinks. And I don't have a better friend than your mama. But, Mama, you get out of my way when I'm messing with that boy because I'm his preacher. I'm, I'm yours when I'm talking to you. But I'm his when I'm talking to him. And last I checked, he's a grown man. And that video room ain't going to be a youth hangout. We might as well just fix this thing. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, if you don't know what you're doing wrong, son, you don't care about what I want to do right. Because if you loved me and you submitted to me, you'd know what my heart is and my message is and you wouldn't go about establishing your own kingdom in the video room. I really feel good now. Jesus. Jesus. Well, Exodus 20, verse, six, verse 10, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with the neighbor's wife, the adultery, well, they should be stoned. Now well, that, that's, that's the law of God. So God loved his people and God wants to, to establish a law so severe that he wants to create moral purity. And so he has to kill some good folks to keep it, he will do it. Now the interesting thing here back in John chapter 8,
where they brought the woman and threw her down in the meeting. He said, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? <laughs> this is really cool, man. This is really cool. <laughs> it's cool. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to, what? Accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Now, this is not the first time Jesus ever took his finger and wrote on the ground. If you go back to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. Exodus 31, verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of stone, tablets of stone written, how were they written? With the finger of God. And so here he is taking tablets of stone that came out of the ground and writing in these tablets of stone with his finger the commandments of God. And that's not all. When you go over to Luke chapter 11 and in verse 20, he says, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come unto you. So there's something to this finger of God. It's the authority of God. Thou art the man. That's what the prophet said to David. You may be the best sound man, and you are, Brother Cox, and I love you. I love you. But that's my sound room before it's yours. And you need to have my heart on it. I have no purpose but this pulpit and your well-being. And I can say to that big boy back there, whom I love with all my heart, either come to it or get away from it. Quit playing around with God. You'll get destroyed. It's better not to even make a vow than to make one and break it. Don't worry how they're doing, Bonnie. Don't worry about them. You just worry how Bonnie's doing. I love you. Say with me, a little leaven. Leaven the whole lump. I don't care. I do care, but I don't care. It's like that young boy right there. He don't know who I am. He thinks I'm up some other little hired preacher that's afraid to talk to him. So there he is. He stoops down on the ground and begins to write. And they keep accusing him. They keep bringing it up to him. Notice. Notice the passage. Notice the passage, please. John 8. Now Moses, verse 5. In the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but they saith thou, thus they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the ground as though he heard them not, and now they think, oh, look at it, he's weak. He's, he's unsure of himself. He's, a, he's afraid. Verse 7, so they continued bombarding him, continued asking him. And then he lifts up himself, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Jesus is saying, you want to talk to me about the law? <laughs> hey, you want to talk to me about the law, Jesus said? I was the one with the finger of God on Mount Sinai who wrote it in the tablets of stone. Don't, 
don't come lecturing me about the law and moral purity and I am the God of glory, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the great I am. I am who I am. He sat down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he had heard him not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you cast the first stone. And then verse 8, he stoops down and writes some more. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I love this right here. This is profound. Can, can, you, can you try to get this? He wrote on the ground. Verse 9. And they, and they which what? But how can you hear words that's written? Because it was rhema. Because it was the oldest Pharisees there. Woman he had stashed over in the east side of Jerusalem. It was the youngest buck there. Uh, stealing that he was doing in the temple funds. He begins to write these things down. And all of a sudden, the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments, the same finger that casts out devils, all of a sudden, this snarling shadow of the Satan that hates the seed of the woman is, is poofed. And light begins to invade this place. And all of a sudden, from the eldest, from the most powerful, down to the least, they begin to leave. They all, they all left the church. Oh, no, 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 don't leave the church. Don't leave. we got a growing program here. And they left. When they heard it being convicted in their own conscience. They went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the least. And Jesus was lifted up, and there wasn't anybody left except his little class, they were there, and the woman. Now, she wasn't a participant, a participant when she came in there. You know. No, no, she wasn't a participant when she came in there. She resented everything. She resented the temple. She resented Jesus. She resented her captives. And now she's changed. Something's happened. That finger of God goes off. That beam of light. My Lord and my God. What's happening here? It was my finger that wrote the law. I have come here not to destroy the law, he says in Matthew 5, 16, but to fulfill it. John 8, 7, so when the continued asking of him, here we find the law giver himself turning the hot white light of the law upon them who had no respect for it themselves. And look at verse 9. And they, when they heard it, being convicted by their own sins, left. Well, what is that? Well, that is the strong man's house being torn down. That's what I'm doing here this morning. I'm tearing down the strong man in any of our houses. Notice Luke 11, verse 21. When a strong man armed keepeth this play, his place, his goods are in peace, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and he divideth his spoils. And verse 23, he that is not with me, Jesus said, is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth, and the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. So the soul of a man is the noble palace that the strong man should dwell in. It's the dwelling place of authority. Your soul is, your mind, your emotions, your will. But an unsatisfied soul is the devil's seat of corruption in a man. That's what you've got to understand, young man. You get off out here with your little phone doing all your little stupid texting. I hate that stuff. Text, 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 text. You're losing, you're, you're, you're losing your brain's development doing that goofy stuff. I, I, I know there's a place for some of that, but... Good heavens, 
and you come to a church meeting, you bring your little machines and you set them up. You go in the coffee shop, and there you are with your little machine doing all this stuff and stuff. What happened to saying, hi, preacher, how you doing? How, I'm fine, how you doing? What's the problem? Well, it's this. How, how, see, don't send me no text. Talk. Have we lost the ability to communicate? Talk. In Matthew eleven twenty, Jesus is the finger of God, is the Spirit of God. Here it is, the finger of God. Satan is crushed like a moth with the truth of the finger of God. The devil is hell, <coughs> a devil, and his hellish strong man is broken. And when he possesses a man, he spoils his goods. wants to take over your palace, your mind, your will, and your emotion. Jesus is heaven's strong man. I'm about done. I'm, I'm trying to close. Let's see. Yeah, it's about right for me to close. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 3, 2nd 3, 3. For as much as you manifest, as you are manifestly declared, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, Paul said to this people who meet, I, I like me talking to you as, as you are declared to be the manifested epistle of Christ. That's who you are as believers ministered to by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit, capital S, of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. Wow. I could finish now, but come back tonight, but we're not going to be here tonight, so let me finish real quickly. Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Sunday school class is there. It's kind of like somebody coming down. And say, oh, I don't want to come to the altar. People will see me. Oh, I don't want to come to the altar. People will wonder why I'm going down there. It's because you need to. Why do you care if somebody sees you at the altar? You ought to be leading them down here. There's some of you who never come to the altar once since I've been your pastor. The altar is a holy place. It's for the righteous before it's for anyone else. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man accused you? And she said, No man, Lord. She calls him Lord. This woman gets saved. How, how could she not get saved? Because she's the one in need. The Pharisees aren't in need. They're trying to murder him. She's there and trapped in filth and sin and the finger of she sees the, the the lightness of this finger of God. She sees that the law he preaches loves the sinner. She sees that the law they stand for murders the sinner. No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Quite a commandment, quite a tough assignment he gave her. But he didn't give her a commandment without changing grace from a moral virtue into divine energy and so when she got saved he stepped inside of her and lit her life and now he says in this new enlightenment in this new ramification of knowing who you are in this new birth go and sin no more and you know let's give God a hand for that we ought to be afraid to be willfully stupid in the church there ought to be some deacon that's going to get on you. There ought to be some Sunday school teacher that's going to get on you. There ought to be some preacher that won't allow Goofy to start. Goofy can be nice when it starts. The 
Verse 12. And I quit. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, Verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, What did he say? I am the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall not, what? Oh, but shall have what? Say illuminated life. Say the gift of knowledge. Say a divine impartation of grace. And the things that make some of you families great is that Joanne Monfort discerns the need of Bill before Bill ever knows he has a need. That Janice Cox always discerning the need of her Enoch before he even knows he has a need because she puts him before herself. And because she puts him before herself, his desire is to put her before himself. And I love you. The fear of God be upon us. The respect and dignity of God be upon us. If you're here without Christ, I bid you come and pray. If you need a church home, I bid you come and let's talk. I open the altar for everyone to come and have a private conversation with God. I know you can do it in your home. I know you do it in your home, but you're not home. This is your home too. This is the office of this church. If you don't love this church, then this altar means nothing to you. And you know, Wendy, when you get your little degree and you get your job, I'm going to see if the stronghold you've built of missing church still possesses you. You count my life as something, well, very secondary, if anything. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, let's stand.